My text this morning is uh, Exodus chapter 11, the chapter we read together, and I want to make a few remarks on verse 7. Exodus chapter 11 and verse 7. The word of God to us this morning is this. In the last plague, the plague of the death of the firstborn, this is the thing that God fixes on. Against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue against man or beast, that you may know how that the Lord puts a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. The Lord puts a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. Exodus 11, verse 7. Now you may wonder, whatever can this strange event, these plagues 3,000 years ago or whatever, Whatever can they be saying to us today? Whatever relevance can they have for us? And particularly this text. <laughs> well, it's a remarkable coincidence to use Gabriel's word, if you call it a coincidence, uh, that on this particular night, in every house in Egypt, whether it was Pharaoh's palace or whether it was the lowest servant by the riverside, whatever it was, on that night, the firstborn of every family died. But in the land of Goshen, which is in Egypt, where the Hebrews, the Israelite people lived, that very same night, not one died. The difference was the angel of death struck in the land of Egypt, but uh, to use God's word, passed over uh, the land of Goshen, the Israelites. As long as the Israelites were in their houses, God stipulated this, in their houses, and they had taken the precautions that God insisted that they took. They might quarrel with these precautions. They might wonder what it was all about. They might question this and that and the other. But if they obeyed God in his word, however strange the precautions might seem to them, the significant thing that night was that though there was sorrow in every Egyptian house, Nothing happened amongst the Jews. The precautions, in case you don't know, was they had to eat a certain meal and they had to uh, put the blood of the animal that they shed to make that meal. They had to spray that and paint that on the doorposts and the lintel. And the point was that when the angel saw the blood on the lintel, uh, the angel passed over. Now, there was nothing in the blood. It was all a symbol, a picture. The blood didn't do anything. It was just the blood of a lamb. That was all. But God was teaching the Israelites some very important lessons that day. And the important lesson which has come down in history from that night when the... Um, angel passed over this blood was that Christ would come, the Messiah would come, the Lord Jesus would come. He, the Lamb of God, that was the name that was given to him, would live a perfect life. The Lamb had to be without blemish for the Jews. Uh, and he was sacrificed, Calvary. Now there's no symbol in this, there's no picture in this, this is the reality. 
However strange it may seem, the blood he shed at Calvary, this is what God says, the blood he shed at Calvary is effective to take away sin. John, the apostle, said this, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, taketh away all sin. You can quarrel with it, you can argue about it and think about it and try to understand it, but I'm telling you what the Word of God says, that the blood of Christ shed for sinners, for all who are, in the Israelites' terms, in the shelter of that blood, under the blood, the angel of death passed it over. That was a picture. I mean, it literally happened, but it was pictured to Israel. But today it's no picture. The Bible tells us that these pictures have all given way, these shadows are all gone. If you want to know the text, it's Colossians 2, 17. The shadows have all given way and the reality has come. And the reality is from the Passover, but that's Exodus chapter 12, of course. The reality is that the blood of Christ washes away all sin for all who trust him, for all who are sheltering under him, for any man or woman, boy or girl, who is brought to that position where they know that they're sinners, but they trust the Savior, rely upon his blood. They can't understand it. They can't explain it, but they believe, they trust, they hope, they rest in this fact. And the fact is that the blood washes away all sin, the righteousness of Christ and so on, perfects them forever. But that's Exodus 12. What about Exodus 11? The point that God is making here is not so much about the sheltering under the blood. He makes a great deal of that later on, of course. But there is a point here in Exodus 11. And what is the point? Is The point is this. The point is this, that God was making a difference. And what a difference it was between the Egyptians and Israel. Just think of it. I mean, don't sort of act in a religious way and sort of make it super um, sanctified. I don't know what the word is, but just think about it. You're living in those days. I've got a firstborn. I mean, he's 60 now, but he's, he's still my firstborn. He's got a firstborn and so on. I mean, these things are real. The firstborn in every house in Egypt died. I'm not talking about why this happened. I mean, that, that's a very big subject about the plagues and so on. But I'm just telling you what happened. Pharaoh, down to the servant girl, in the household, firstborn, died. But not amongst the Jews. Not in Goshen. Not amongst the Israelites. If they were under the blood. And my text is, that you may know. <laughs> I'm trying to make us know. What do you say about this? God puts... A difference between the Egyptians and Israel. So what does that mean to you? Well, let's just do a bit more, first of all. That's not the only occasion. There were other plagues. This is the last plague. In some of the other plagues, here's one, for example. Chapter 8, and verse 21 to 24. In chapter 8, verses 21 to 24, we read this. There was a plague of flies. This is earlier than the plague of the Passover. I will send swarms of flies. Yeah. Can you imagine it? The house is full of flies. I've known people go berserk if there's one fly in a house. They start slashing about with the swatter and they'll break anything inside. Can you imagine a house full of crawling with them? And then you get verse 23. I will put a division between my people and thy people, between Israel and Egypt. 
What difference? Verse 24, there came a grievous swarm of flies into the house of Pharaoh. Egypt's houses were full of flies. The Israelite houses were empty. That you may know that God distinguishes between these two peoples. You get it in chapter 9, verses 4 to 7. You get this. I think it's just the lice or the murrain it's called here. It's a plague of some kind, lice. 9, chapter 4 to 7. The Lord shall sever between the cattle of Israel and the cattle of Egypt. The cows are dying. There shall nothing die of all that is in the children of Israel, that that belongs to them. Their cows won't die, but Egypt's cows will die. You get it again in verse 26. Only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, there was no hail. That was the plague of hail. Every time something was happening like this, the disaster was striking in Egypt, but it was not striking in Israel. God was teaching Israel something here. He was teaching Pharaoh something here. He was telling Pharaoh something. And he's telling us too, because it's recorded in God's word. And what is he telling us? Well, let me give you my text again. The Lord puts a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. What's that got to do with me? Oh, yeah. Okay. Let's go on a bit further to make sure that we really understand it. After the Passover, Israel has to cross the Red Sea. And in crossing the Red Sea, God overthrows the Egyptians. And then the Israelites end up in the wilderness of all places. And they come to a place called Mount Sinai. God has strange ways of dealing with us. He leads them out of Egypt. He makes them cross this Red Sea. And then they end up under Mount Sinai. And then we read this. In Exodus chapter 19 and verse 5 and 6. Exodus 19 verses 5 and 6. They're there under the mountain. Now they don't realize it, but this is going to be a very important day, a very important couple of days, few days, in their whole existence. God is going to do something while they're under Mount Sinai for Israel. He's going to do something which will go down in the rest of history. What he's going to do is bring Moses up to the top of the mountain of Sinai, and he's going to give Moses the law, the old covenant, the Mosaic covenant is called. He's going to speak to Moses, and Moses is going to bring this law back to Israel. Now, that's another big subject, so I haven't got time to develop it this morning, but this is a traumatic state. A uh, change, uh, an introduction. This is, it has ramifications right through the rest of the Bible. But before Moses goes up to the mountain, God speaks to Israel. And this is what he says to them Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 to 6. Now, therefore, I'm going to speak to Moses, right? He says in verse 4, by the way, that you remember what I did to the Egyptians. You, you remember all that, that I made a distinction between you and them. You remember that. Well, of course they do. Now then, verse 5, now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, that which I'm going to give Moses now, 
then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all the earth. You shall be to me, verse 6, a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. Whatever does he mean by being a peculiar people, a peculiar nation? Well, I'm peculiar. Most of you know that. That means to say, in my case, that I'm considered to be a crank. And I fully accept that. I understand it. I'm odd. I realize that. I have odd views, and I take odd stances, and I'm very, well, I'm a peculiar, yeah. But that's not what the word means here. What it means here is special. Special, you shall be to me, says God to this people, you shall be to me a special people. Above all peoples on the earth, you will be the special people. I'm going to make a difference between you, not only between you and Egypt, but between you and all the rest. You're going to be different. If. Because there was an if. Here it is. If, he says to Israel, you stick to this covenant that I'm going to give you. See, God is dividing between Egypt and Israel. He's dividing between, Egypt, uh, between Israel and the rest of the nations. There's plenty of nations about, the Philistines, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Moabites, the lot. <laughs> There's plenty about. But God says, you, you, this is your covenant my law for you, and you are to keep it, and you will be my special people. God puts a difference between Israel and the rest. Now, let's extend it a bit. This, in fact, the Bible makes clear to us, and that's what I'm preaching to you, the Bible makes clear that God always does that. That's the way he's always working. Right from day one to the end day, God always works in this way. Adam had two sons. Well, he had more, but he had two sons at one stage. Cain and Abel. And it's quite clear, as you read your Bible, Genesis chapter 4 and other places, Hebrews 11, it's quite clear that God put a difference between these two men. They were different men, and they certainly acted differently, and God put a difference to them, in between them. Which would you rather be? Well, you'd rather be Cain, no? Or would you rather be Abel? Do you remember Thomas Hardy's book, um, Far from the madding crowd. Do you remember the name of the little boy in the um, in the uh, in in the farm? He was a farm boy, and his name was Cain Ball. Cain Ball. And the if you remember the story, the the locals. Thomas Hardy always listened to the local people talking, and he brought it back into his books, and the. Locals said it was his mother's fault. When she was at the font, because they were Anglicans, and she had him christened, she got mixed up. She wanted to call him Abel, but she made a mistake and called him Cain. But if you know the story of the Bible, you know that that was bad news for Cain. And the villagers said, we call him Cainy, to soften it, Cainy Ball. But it's all built on this point, you see. You've got to understand these Victorian novelists. You've got to know your Bible. It's, all, it's only a little joke, but it's all built on this distinction between Cain and Abel. But it was no joke. God did distinguish between those two. Jump forward a few years and come to Noah. I don't know how many people are living on the earth at the time when Noah was there. I don't know, but I tell you this, he was on his own, virtually. And it's only he and a few others, a handful of others, that managed to get in the ark. And he wasn't any great shakes himself. But nevertheless, God distinguished between Noah and the rest. I know where I would have rather been in that day. 
with Noah in the ark, however cramped it was, and with the rest outside, be drowned in the flood. Now, if you think that this is just Old Testament, I'm telling you it goes over into the New Testament. Let me remind you, Paul writes a letter to the church at Rome, the believers there, and uh, he has told them some very wonderful things about the sovereignty of God and the purpose of God and the will of God. In chapter 8, he says some of the most glorious things you could ever read. There is no condemnation to any man who's in Christ. Never condemned. For any man who's trusting that blood I was talking about just now, trusting that Savior, there is no condemnation to him. What's more, he goes on to say in the chapter, nobody can make an accusation against him. What's more, he says, He'll never be separated from the love of God. And it's all, he says in Romans chapter 8, because of God's sovereign purpose and will. He makes a difference and he sticks to his purpose and he sticks to that difference and he holds his own forever and ever and ever. But then he imagines that there's somebody listening, actually listening to him and reading what he's saying, who's prepared to heckle him. And if you want to heckle me, you're welcome. I mean it. Yeah. Paul welcomed hecklers. And he got some. And the heckler called out. It's only imaginary, but Paul puts words down to show you this. The heckler calls out, ah, that's all very well, you talking about God's sovereignty. That's all very well. But you look at the time when Christ came into the world and the gospel was preached, you see what the Jews made of that. Well, in the beginning, many Jews were converted, but it wasn't long before the Jews turned against Christ, turned against the gospel, they crucified the Christ, they, they would have nothing to do with him, and when the gospel came, they by and large rejected the, the gospel. So this heckler says, how can you talk about God's sovereignty? Why didn't the Jews believe? Paul answers it in Romans 9, 10, and 11. And this is the answer. You might not like it. But this is what Paul says. Well, you've got to understand, he says, a man might be a Jew, but he might not be a Jew. What do you mean, Paul? He might belong to Israel, but he might not be a true Israelite. What's a true Israelite? A man who, when the gospel comes, really does believe. You see, he says, they're not all Israel, which are Israel. Just because a man has got the name that he's an Israelite, it doesn't mean to say that he really is. And when the gospel comes, it shows and that the true Israelite receives Christ and believes him. You know, Paul, when he's on the Damascus Road, he was hating Christ, Acts chapter 9. He was hating Christ. Christ confronted him and he's immediately converted. Well, within a day or two. This is the example of what I'm talking about. And Paul takes it up in Romans 9. Now, the reason is, he said, because it's God's purpose. God always distinguishes. I said, you might not like it. Keep listening. God makes a choice. God distinguishes. I'll prove it to you, he says. Romans chapter 9, you can read it for yourself. The proof is this. Well, let me give you an example, he said. Isaac and Rebekah had two sons. Now, it was uh, Jacob and Esau. Well, it was Esau and Jacob, actually, elder and younger, right? Now, it was a dysfunctional family. God's people are often a strange lot. Isaac and Rebekah, dysfunctional family. Isaac favored Esau. Rebekah favored Jacob. That's bad news. 
They become men. Various things happen. And in a force of circumstances, we haven't time to develop this morning, Jacob, although he was not the firstborn, became the equivalent of the firstborn. Now, I can give you all the reasons for it, Jacob and Esau, Isaac and Rebekah, I can explain all that. But the fundamental reason is given in Romans 9. And you won't like it, some of you, but this is what it said. Esau have I hated, Jacob have I loved. God made a distinction. It's not the only time it happens again and again in the Bible. It happened with Joseph's sons, Manasseh's sons, and so on. It goes on and on and on. Paul realized that people don't like it. So he quoted a text of scripture, the prophet Malachi. What did me Malachi say? Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. People still don't like it. Oh, they say it's not fair. And this is what Paul says to them. Who are you to talk about fairness with your small brain? Every mouth must be stopped. God is sovereign. If he makes a difference between Egypt and Israel, he makes that difference. And you can argue about it as much as you like, he said, but it stands. God makes a difference between Esau and Jacob. You can argue about it till the cows come home, but it's the truth. And God said to Israel, if you will obey my covenant, you will be a special people to me. Now the Philistines might grumble, or the Assyrians might grumble, but the truth of God stands. I'm not here to explain God or explain God away. I'm here just to simply state the truth. I'm willing to be corrected, but I'm quoting the Bible, Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11, all the way through there. It goes on and on, my friend. Paul writes to Titus. And he says this. We're looking for that blessed hope, he said. And what, what is this blessed hope? The glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Christ is coming again, he said. And we're looking forward to that. But before we get to that day, just look back, he said who gave himself for us, he looks back now to the cross, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from slavery, that's what it means, just like Egypt, just like Israel in Egypt, redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself, exactly what the Passover was picturing, and purify unto himself, and this is what the authorized says. And I'm reading the authorized this morning, it's the version you use. It's old fashioned language, but here it is. And purify unto himself a peculiar people. Ah, that word again. Now, I told you just now, I'm peculiar. Yeah, okay, right. But I'm peculiar in another sense, too, my friend. The peculiar sense that Paul meant. What did Paul mean about this? Uh, that Christ died to purchase, redeem a people that were specially his own. That's what he means. Specially his own. God was making a difference. When Christ died on the cross, he was dying for his people. Thou shalt call his name Jesus. I quoted it in prayer. Well, I quoted, I quoted another text, but this one will do. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. A peculiar people, a people that God makes a division about. They shall be mine, he says in Malachi. They're mine. (laughs) 
Peter's not going to be left out. Uh, the um, ribbon in the Bible here this morning was left in this chapter. I don't know whether that means the last week's preacher was preaching on this passage, but here it is again, then, if it was. Peter, writing to believers, he says this to them. You are a chosen generation. <coughs> A royal priesthood, echoes of Exodus 19, 5 to 6 here, and holy nation, wait for it, a peculiar people. <laughs> Not all boss, it doesn't mean that. They might be all boss, I certainly am. It doesn't mean that, no, a special people. God always polarizes. What do I mean by that? North and south. God always polarizes the human race. I'm telling you, God is still polarizing the human race. In Egypt, it was Egypt and Israel. In Isaac's family, it was Jacob and Esau. Today, the division, I can prove it to you from the Bible, is believer and unbeliever. God always polarizes. You must have noticed it. Christ, how many times he polarized it? He talked about sheep and goats. He talked about his left hand and his right hand. He talked about the broad way and the narrow way. He talked about darkness and light. He talked about life and death, you, you name it. It's always either or. Now men and women too always want a middle road. I told some of you this story before, it's a true story, but I've told you before, I'll repeat it. I used to live in Lowestoft, just up the, well, over on the East Coast. If you know Lowestoft, it's a coastal support, and it's got one problem, well, it's got several problems, but one problem it's got is that it's got an inlet to the sea. Or an inlet to the land, I suppose you might say, yeah, an outlet to the sea. The sea's out here, the North Sea, and the port, the shipbuilding yard, or yards, are on the inner port, inside the land. There's an outer port, but the main port was inside the land. Of course, the vessels had to come from the North Sea into the in report, of course they did, and they had to go out. Unfortunately, the main London road from Yarmouth down to London passed over that inlet, that cut. There's no hills in that part of the world. It was all flat. The bridge only just cleared the water. So whenever, whenever a ship was passing, in or out, naturally the bridge had to lift up. That meant the traffic had to stop. This is a serious thing. And all the time I lived there, and for 50 years before that, I think, and I don't know whether they've solved it yet. The problem is still there. The plans they've been discussing to get around this. This bridge goes up, all the traffic stops. It was such a nuisance that the advice was, if you came to live in the town as we did, if you worked in the north, as I did, north of the town, you were wise to build, to get a house in the north of the town. Because if you had a house in the south and you wanted to get to your job or wherever it was, you had to cross this river. Well, that's okay, but if the bridge was up and it would quite often break and stay up, you could be stuck. Now, some clever road engineers, I don't think they actually drove motor cars, but they were very clever, they devised a system that would ease the traffic. And what they devised, they noticed that the bridge was just wide enough to take three lanes. 
very good. So they would divide the bridge into three, three lanes, right? In the mornings, because most people who, uh, who lived on the south wanted to work in the north, okay, the commuters were coming north. So in the morning, it was two lanes going north. And in the evening, it was two lanes going south. That means the middle lane, for some time of the day, was going north, and the middle lane was some time of the day going south. Locals knew. But if you were a visitor and you were approaching the bridge, it was a strange way of approaching the bridge, it was a one-way system, you would come upon the bridge suddenly, you had two lanes where you were, say, and you were going along nicely, and suddenly those two lanes disappeared and became one except the middle lane was still there and you couldn't, you saw it and you could go onto the bridge on the middle lane. But unfortunately, it was a north going lane at the moment. They tried all sorts of schemes to keep people off the middle lane in the wrong time of day. Lights flashing, whistles going, I don't know what. And there was one thing which said, use both lanes. That did not mean, as some wit said, drive down the middle of the road. There is no middle lane here. It's either or. That's the point I'm making here. For or against. Remember what Christ said? A man is either for me or against me. Now, I've got to come to some application of this. My time is gone, so I won't. I was going to deal with this matter of... uh, Let me just mention it. This matter of this distinction, what a comfort it is, my friend, for those of us who know that Christ is our Savior. What a comfort it is. God makes a distinction. Romans 8, he makes a distinction in his will and he sticks to it. I've explained to you that many of God's people are very oddballs. Well, I'm one of them, but God lives with oddballs. And as long as a man or a woman is in Christ, then I'll say with John, if God be for us, who can be against us? Now, I don't know what you're passing through at the moment. You don't know what I'm passing through. We were getting these problems, issues and difficulties. Well, what am I going to do? Let's get this right, my friend. If God is for us, if God has made the distinction, You know Jacob's wandering through the world, but God always had his hand upon him. That's one application. I'd like to develop that, but oh, it's a precious thought, my friend. Think of it. People argue about election, argue about sovereignty of God. Don't argue about it, live on it. Above all, die on it. My friend, who's now long since been in glory, members, he said he very heard a very fine sermon on election by a famous man. Marvelous sermon, he said. Very, best sermon he ever heard on it. He said, if it's one thing to preach it, he said, but it's another to live it, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, that I might enjoy the fact that in Christ, in him forever, nothing can thwart God in his purpose. I don't care what you're going to go through this week, my friend, and who knows what it might be. I don't know myself. But come what may, my friend, if Christ is ours, I'll live with that distinction. But I'll make another application, and even more application. Well, I'll make another application God said to Israel, you must keep this distinction up. You must always keep this distinction up. And I'm afraid if you know your Bible history, you will know that Israel absolutely failed miserably to keep that distinction up. They went into uh, paganism, they went into Egypt, they went into Assyria, they went everywhere, adultering that covenant which God gave them. And of course, God took them into captivity exile, and so on. And therefore, Paul says, 2 Corinthians 6, writing to the people of God, 
Be ye separate. You're distinct. You're a special people. Now live like it. My friend, I could develop it, but I won't. The time has gone. Do you know that's a word for today? The churches today need to hear this. Come out from Babylon. God says so. Babylon is over there, but my people must be over here. I've been a bit mystical there, I expect, for some of you. But God demands us to show that distinction in the world. I know people today are arguing black is white. They're saying to win the world, we must become like the world. Rubbish. We must show that we're different to the world. Well, that was the third application. But one before I close. It's Moses himself. Moses saw this distinction. Well, of course he did. God showed him. Exodus 11. Yeah. Oh, no, no. Long before that. Long before that. Moses was born to a Jewish woman. Pharaoh had commanded that all Jewish boys should be drowned. His mother chose to disobey. She had only one hope. Well, she had no hope. It was just the last desperate throw. She put him in a little box and chucked him into the Nile and hoped, I don't know what she hoped for, but by a remarkable coincidence, yeah, by a remarkable coincidence, Pharaoh's daughter heard the little boy crying. And she adopted him. The sister Miriam was standing by and she said, shall I take him to a Hebrew woman to nurse him? Yes. So she took him back to the mother. So he was brought up a Jew, an Israelite, but he was adopted by Pharaoh's daughter. So he became an Egyptian Jew, a remarkable man. We come to the story now when he's a young man. He's now a prince in Egypt. He's right close to the throne. He has tremendous power and wealth. He's got the world in his hands. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, loved Egypt. He loved all the wealth. Nah. He refused to be called the son of the Pharaoh's daughter. Hey, he threw it all over. He knew that God made a distinction. And he said, my lot is not with Egypt. He said, choosing rather to suffer affliction. Yeah, you can say that again. Affliction with the people of God than the pleasures, enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season esteeming the reproach of Christ. He could see Christ by faith. Remarkable thing. Thousands of years before, 3,000 years before, he could see Christ by faith. Greater riches than all the treasures in Egypt. This man was showing where his choice was. Talk about God's choice, and I've done that, but my friend, there's a choice here too. What are you choosing, Egypt or Israel? Do you want to be with Cain or Abel? Of a God choice? You can be a believer, my friend, or an unbeliever. Which is it? You can come to Christ or you can refuse him. Most people turn their back on him. Most people think it's eyewash. Most people think it's a joke. But there are some very odd people who actually trust the Lord Jesus Christ. They esteem the riches of Christ. Even affliction and troubles, whatever it may come for that, they esteem Christ better riches than all the treasures of the world. Can you believe it? No wonder they're peculiar. Oh, to belong to the peculiar people. There used to be some people in Essex called the peculiar people. They gloried in the name. What do you, what's your people called? Peculiar people. Well, that's a good name, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I never was one of them, but I am one of them. <laughs> yeah. My friend, so I'm putting it to you. God has made his choice. God has shown where his stance is. Now I'm asking you where yours is. 
Oh, well, I'll think about it. No, no, no. Moses didn't think about it. That's the people for me, he said. Ah, oh, well, it'll cost you something, man. Asked, I don't care what it costs. I'll take it. Joshua did the same. He's an old man like I am. And he was preaching his last sermon. This might be my last sermon. And his last sermon was this. You can make your mind up. You can choose whichever it is. Go back to Egypt. Go back to those gods. Or stick with Jehovah. Stick with the Lord Almighty. Now, he's way back now before the gospel. But if he was here today, he'd be saying it's Christ or what? But I'll tell you what I'll choose, he said. As for me and my house, it's the Lord. What's your choice? Ah, but I'll go down the middle of the road. <laughs> Very uncomfortable place, my friend. I shouldn't advise it. If you I take my advice, my urging, my plea, cast in your lot with Christ and do it now. I'd rather, I don't know if it's true or not, I'll finish with this, but I, I don't know if it's true or not, but the Queen Mother, as she was, was once asked by an African um, chief. I'd like to believe it's true. I hope it's true. She was once asked by a, an African chief um, when she was visiting Africa. It must have been 50, 60 years ago or 70 years ago. I don't know how long ago. And he must have asked her about Christ. And she replied with these words, I'd rather have Jesus than silver and gold. I hope it's true. What about you, my friends? Who is on the Lord's side, said Francis Havergal. Well, I hope you'll say yes. I'll sign up. May God bless his word then to us all. Amen.